Welcome back. We've been walking through the original Constitution in textual order. We've covered the preamble. We've covered Articles 1, 2, and 3, the legislative, executive, and judicial powers of the United States. Um, we've uh, talked about Article 4, which focused on states and territories, on the relationship, the horizontal relationship uh, among the states, um, and uh, the significance of the territories and the way in which the federal government is going to have important um, powers over the territories to um, make those uh, uh, territories eventually um, Republican states admitted on equal footing with uh, the original 13, um, rather than um, acting as a permanent colonizer over the West. Um, and how the federal government will also have the power to make sure that individual states um, maintain basic standards of, of republican government, of democracy, of fair elections, and free speech in order to protect the people of each state from a possibly tyrannical government, a military coup, or, or something like that, to protect the people of, of each state against its own government if that government sort of fails to maintain minimum republican standards, and in so doing also protect neighboring states because tyrannical, monarchical, unrepublican regimes are threats not just to their own people but to their neighbors. That's what history has taught us, um, going all the way back to um, uh, uh, Philip of Macedon, Alexander's father, who threatened um, the, the surrounding democratic um, uh, um, uh, uh, regimes in, in, in Greece. Um, uh, and also it will protect, um, by protecting the republican government of each state, um, uh, the federal government will be able to protect basically its own foundations because the federal government sits atop state building blocks. State election law defined, at least in the first instance, federal election law for the House of Representatives. State legislatures are picking senators at the founding. State law is determining the, uh, um, the selection of elector, uh, electors for the Electoral College. And if states are screwing up basic electoral functions, that's going to compromise the fundamental foundations of uh, the federal government, and, and that actually did happen with the Civil War. Um, and again, arguably, in the 20th century, when uh, states uh, were allowed for um, uh, before, uh, a while to, to run shoddy elections and to prevent people from voting who had a right to vote, and once again, federal intervention was required. Uh, the second reconstruction of the 1960s, building on the first reconstruction, of the 1860s. So that's what we've talked about thus far. The preamble, how the Constitution was ordained and established, Articles 1, 2, and 3, legislative, executive, judicial power, Article 4, states and territories. We've now made it to the end of the original Constitution, Articles 5, 6, and 7. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today and in the next lecture. Um, these um, three concluding um, articles of the Constitution, all quite short, uh, are united by a theme of basically constitutional supremacy. Um, they explain why and how the Constitution actually takes priority over other kinds of law. In fact, the, they refer repeatedly, as did the preamble, to the Constitution. Remember, the preamble talks about how this Constitution is uh, to be ordained uh, uh, and established. Articles 5, 6, and 7 uh, provide further reflection on the nature of this Constitution. Uh, let's start with Article 5. It talks about how this Constitution is to be amended. Um, and there are basically, um, under Article 5, four amendment pathways. Two different ways an amendment can be proposed and two different ways an amendment can be ratified. It can be proposed, and this is in fact how all the amendments thus far have been proposed by Congress. Two-thirds of the House two-thirds of the Senate. So a special supermajority vote for Congress suffices to propose an amendment. The President actually plays no role in, in the process. Um, I, I, partly, the, I think the idea is the amendment process is just a different kind of process than the enactment of ordinary legislation. So two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate suffice to put an amendment out there to be ratified by the states. and. It, um, in order to succeed under the express terms of Article 5, um, uh, three-quarters of the states have to ratify. And, um, and they can ratify either um, by uh, state legislatures or, if Congress so provides, special state conventions uh, can be the ratifying body, specially elected state conventions. But again, the rule is three-quarters. So two different ways uh, an amendment can be ratified, either by state legislatures 
uh, or by state conventions. And all the amendments thus far, except one, the repeal of prohibition, the 25th Amendment, excuse me, the 21st Amendment, have been ratified by state legislatures. So, but two different uh, uh, ratifying mechanisms, but three cores of the states. Each state counted um, the same as any other state. And two different proposing mechanisms. Um, Congress, two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate. There's another proposing mechanism that's never been used. Um, if enough states ask, uh, Congress is supposed to call a proposing convention, maybe on the model of the Philadelphia Convention, to propose amendments to the Constitution that, again, presumably would go to the states for, for ratification. Um, so two different pathways of proposing a convention uh, model that's never been used and a congressional proposal model which has generated all the 27 textual amendments um, thus far um, uh, and um, two different ratifying mechanisms. State legislatures, three-quarters of them, all the amendments except the repeal of prohibition, the 21st, and if Congress so provides, it can instead, though, provide for state ratifying conventions, special, special ratifying conventions to, to, to ratify a proposed constitutional amendment. So, so um, what to think about Article 5? Um, I think several things. One, arguably, the rules of amendment are the most fundamental, most important element of the Constitution. They specify the rules by which everything else can be changed. They operate on a, a higher plane, if you, if you will, or maybe if you want to think of it, a deeper, more fundamental level than everything else in the Constitution. These are the rules by which almost everything else in the document can be modified. Uh, and Article 5, I think, did a pretty good job of it, especially when we compare it to its predecessors. The Greek um, regimes um, that had democracy, even if they, they um, had a con democratic constitution, they often didn't have good mechanisms for constitutional amendment. Um, the British constitution, um, uh, to the extent that it was claimed to just be inherited from uh, the ancients, had no kind of, ex it was unwritten and no express provision um, for amendments now. Parliamentary sovereignty as a practical matter might mean that par anything Parliament wants to do, it can do, but then that raises a different problem. Do you really want to um, allow your ordinary legislature to modify the rules anytime it wants, to modify the rules for its own election, to, for example, end regular elections or expand its term of office um, a threefold or, or um, what have you. Let's think about the Articles of Confederation. Its biggest flaw was that as a practical matter, it was unamendable. All 13 states had to combine, and because you could never get all 13 states to agree on anything, Rhode Island would always opt out, or if not Rhode Island, somewhere, someone else. Basically, the framers at Philadelphia were forced to work outside the Articles of Confederation framework. Um, uh, because Rhode Island refused even to show up at Philadelphia. So if every state had to be on board, it was just a non-starter. Um, and so here's actually what the framers of the Constitution said to their critics. The critics said, listen, you know, you forgot a Bill of Rights. The, Congress, the House of Representatives is, is too small. There are not insufficient protections for, for a jury trial. But about unenumerated rights? We've got lots of objections to this thing. And the framers said, the supporters said, well, maybe you're right. But here's one thing that we got going for this plan. It's fixable. It has within it provisions for its own modification. And the Articles of Confederation, as a practical matter, aren't fixable. So vote for the Constitution now. Once we get it up and running, we can have amendments um, uh, and, and we can fix the thing. And we promise, say, moderate Federalists, that we'll work with you on that. So in some ways, the, the, the amendability of the Constitution is one of its biggest uh, selling points. Now, um, compare the Constitution to the, um, the state constitutions, the federal Constitution. Some of them didn't have any provisions for amendments. Um, and presumably, the Constitution can be amended by the same mechanism by which it was ordained and established, but th that wasn't so clear, at least textually. Um, some of the states basically allowed the legislature to uh, amend by ordinary statute. 
Um, so then, in what sense is the Constitution sort of higher and deeper than ordinary law? Fundamental law, law that limits even the legislature, that stands outside the legislature. Other states provided for special legislative votes. Um, so you needed special legislative majorities, but only the legislature could amend. Well, what happens if the people want a constitutional amendment that would limit the legislature? If the legislature has a monopoly on amendment, it's just never going to propose maybe such um, uh, um, uh, things that it doesn't like that might limit its own power. Other states said, well, there can be amendments and they can occur outside the legislature, but only at certain specified dates. Well, what happens if you want need to make an important change outside those dates? And indeed, in ratifying the U.S. Constitution, a bunch of states, in effect, were modifying their state constitutions and they were doing so outside the framework of their amendment provisions, outside the date clauses, for example, of, of their um, uh, amendment uh, provision. So none of the states really had a, uh, some states provided for a, 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 a special convention mechanism um, for constitutional amendment outside the legislature, but didn't have enough details on how that convention was going to be, um, was going to operate. Um, so judged against the baseline of Greece and the British Constitution and the Articles of Confederation and the 13 state constitutions, the, the, the U.S. Constitution's Article 5 is, is fairly impressive. It, does, it, it, it has some flaws. It doesn't quite say how that proposing convention, which we've never had, is going to work, and that's a big can of worms. For example, how is it going to be apportioned? On the model of Philadelphia, one state, one vote? Um, or on the model of um, the House of Representatives, sort of proportion. Who's going to decide um, what voting rule, not just apportionment rule, but voting rule that convention uh, adopts? Is it simple majority, two thirds, um, uh, something in between? You know, how are the, the delegates to that convention going to be picked? Um, will Congress lay down the rules? Will the state legislatures lay down the rules? So Article 5 is not a model of precision and clarity, and, and, uh, but compared to its predecessors, it's not, not a bad first cut. Um, critics have said Article 5 is too, it sets the bar of amendment too high. Um, but early on um, in, the, in the founder's own lifetime, Thomas Jefferson's lifetime, uh, um, John Adams, um, uh, uh, James Madison, and so on, we get um, 12 early amendments, actually, uh, uh, 10 amendments that we call the Bill of Rights, and an 11th and 12th early on. So, so these people who gave us the Constitution were able to amend um, uh, the thing to their satisfaction. Um, and when I was a young person, I used to say, gee, the Constitution is sort of too hard to amend. Things could be a lot better, and they're stopped because two-thirds, two-thirds, three-quarters is very high. Now that I'm a little older, I think, yeah, it could be much better, but you know what? It could be much worse. Um, and here's one interesting thing about Article 5. It set the bar high enough that most of the bad uh, amendment proposals have actually fallen by the wayside. They haven't cleared the bar. Um, maybe it's screened out a few good amendments, but it's also filtered out a lot of bad ones. Almost every amendment has actually made amends, made the system better. And we're going to see that in later lectures, a Bill of Rights, the Reconstruction Amendments, the Progressive Era Amendments, the, the, the amendments from the 1960s. So a lot of amendments that have improved the system, almost none that have made it worse. Maybe prohibition, but that gets repealed soon enough with the 21st Amendment. So, so the amendment mechanism really did work. It worked enough to, it was supple enough to add prohibition and then to get rid of it. So, so um, I think actually Article 5 is um, um, not as bad probably as I thought as a young man. One of the biggest questions about Article 5 is, is it the only mechanism of constitutional amendment or could the people of, of um, 2121 um, uh, adopt an entirely new constitution outside Article 5 uh, in the same way that we adopted the Constitution itself outside the Articles of Confederation or something. That's an interesting theoretical question, not a big practical one today, perhaps, but, but who knows? In, in your lifetime, maybe that issue will, will resurface. Uh, now, before we move away from Article 5, one other set of wrinkles about Article 5 I wanted to, to highlight. Um, it says that there's, it has a clause saying provided that. So ordinarily, two-thirds of the House, 
two-thirds of the Senate and three-quarters of the states can create an amendment. And the president doesn't need to be involved, and the states can act again either by ordinary legislative ratification if Congress so provides or by special um, convention. Um, and then there's this other mechanism that's never been used, states asking Congress um, for a special convention that gets summoned. By the way, another question is, could Congress call such a special convention on its own motion? Let's say if a majority of Americans from across the country petitioned for some Philadelphia II convention, could Congress provide for that even if the states um, uh, didn't ask for it? Um, so so we, um, we've got Article 5, but it has one other um, clause that I want to to highlight, because remember, you know, arguably this is the most important part of the Constitution, determining how everything else might be modified. Article 5 says, provided that, you know, these are the ordinary rules, provided that, uh, and um, one, that, the, that the rules for importing slaves won't be changed until, um, the 1808 clause won't be changed. So, so we're not going to, according to Article 5, we don't want an amendment that says, you can start um, prohibiting the importation of slaves in 1800 or 1795 or whatever. Well, that's a moot issue today um, because we're past 1808 and we've gotten rid of not just the, inter the international uh, importation of slaves, the, 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 um, uh, the, the slave trade, uh, the Atlantic slave trade. Um, we've gotten rid of slavery itself. So that provision, uh, and that's the 13th Amendment, and we'll talk about that in great detail in later lectures. So that's kind of a moot point. Um, but the other provision of Article 5 says, no state can be deprived its equal weight in the Senate without its own consent. So you might think as a practical matter, if we wanted to change the Senate, if we wanted to have a, um, an, a, a proportional upper house, um, as well as a, propor a proportional by population lower house, if we wanted our Senate, U.S. Senate, to look like state Senates, which are proportional. Um, they're not malapportioned. It's not one county, one vote in, in state upper houses today. If we wanted to change the Senate, um, you might think, as a practical matter, we'd need every state to sign on, because no state can be deprived under this provi proviso of its equal weight in the Senate without its own consent. So you might think two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate and three-quarters of the states wouldn't suffice. I think you'd be wrong about that. Um, because this provision, this proviso that got added on the last day, they, and they, everyone wanted to go home, or the last week, and, and it wasn't thought through very carefully. It was not part of the great compromise, um, which took many weeks at the Philadelphia Convention between a proportional House and um, uh, states counting equally whether they're populist or not in the Senate. That's the great compromise. That was a big deal in Philadelphia. Lots of discussion of this. This Article 5 proviso, um, sort of cementing that compromise into Article 5 itself with special rules, was kind of added on at the end. They didn't think it through very carefully, and so here's the point. Fine. We won't amend the Senate's apportionment by um, two-thirds, two-thirds, three-quarters. We can't do that, but here's what we can do. We can create and we can take the power from the existing Senate and give it to a new body, um, call it a new upper house, call it the Schmenet, if you will, and that can have almost all the powers of the existing Senate, and we can create that by a simple constitutional amendment that would go through the ordinary Article 5 rules, two-thirds, two-thirds, three-quarters, because the proviso only kicks in if we're modifying the apportionment rules of the Senate itself, not if we're taking power from the Senate and giving it to another body. Or at least I think that's probably the best reading of the Constitution. Note, though, that small states are still going to have a lot of protection in that system because even an ordinary amendment has to pass the Senate by two-thirds vote, and in the existing Senate, each state counts equally, whether it's populous or not. Even under the ordinary rules of Article 5, three-quarters of the states are going to have to say yes, and each state is going to count equally in that process, whether it's Wyoming, which not very many people, California, 70 times as large in population. So the small states are protected by the ordinary rules of Article 5 to a very considerable degree. Now, later in the semester, we'll talk about whether it's even imaginable in the future that we might have uh, a different kind of, of, of Senate. Um, so um, that takes us to the end of Article 5. Uh, and you might ask, okay, well, what's left? We've now talked about how the Constitution is ordained. 
and established in the preamble, legislative, executive, judicial power, Articles 1, 2, and 3. Um, we've talked uh, about federalism, the relationship among the states, and talked about the status of the territories, Article 4. We've talked about the rules of constitutional amendment. What's left? Two things are left, Article 6 and Article 7. That's what we're going to talk about in the next lecture, so stay tuned.